Let's say amen. 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 Before you're seated this morning, I want to encourage you to grab your Bibles. We're going to remain standing for the reading of God's word this morning. And as you're reaching for your Bibles or your phone, whatever that looks like for you this morning, uh, we're going to be turning to 1 John, 1 John chapter 2. You know, it's important sometimes just our posture in honor of God's word to to open it up and to read it together. And uh, 1 John, if you don't know where 1 John is towards the end, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, Revelation. So find Revelation, last book of the Bible, flip a couple of pages back and you're going to find 1 John chapter 2 this morning. And uh, as you're turning there, has anybody ever seen the movie Like Mike? Anybody ever seen the movie Like Mike? Maybe this is the wrong illustration, the wrong crowd. I'm going to tell you anyways about Like Like Mike. Mike was a, uh, this this story Like Mike was about a young a young boy uh, who was an orphan. In this, in this orphanage, he found a pair of basketball shoes with MJ etched in marker on the inside of the, the tongue of the shoe. And when he put on these shoes, he had this amazing ability as a young 13, 14 year old boy to be an NBA star. And every little boy who's ever watched Like Mike at the end of the show is cheering because they, just yes, they love it. They love the power that he possesses. And can I tell you that, that you have a unique advantage and it's not just putting on a pair of shoes. It is the very Holy Spirit of the Spirit of God living on the inside of you. And it gives you power and ability that is beyond your ability. And not just to be like Mike, but to be like Jesus. So today we're gonna read about that, talk about that, discuss that. First John chapter two, if you have it, open this morning and say, I got it. All right. First John chapter two, verse 18 through 27. The apostle John writes and says, children, young believers, it is the last hour. And as you have come to heard that the antichrist is coming. So now many antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not all of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One. Everybody say anointed. You have been anointed by the Holy One and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know because not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Christ, Jesus is the Christ? This is the, uh, this is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. Abide in you, live in you, stay in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive from Him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as His anointing teaches you about everything, and it is true and is no lie, just as, he, just ha, just as it has taught you, abide in Him." Today, I want to preach a message entitled, The Advantage of the Anointing. The Advantage of the Anointing. Father, we thank you for your word today. Lord, we thank you for your power in this place. And Lord, we pray that over these next few moments that your Holy Spirit would speak so clearly. Lord, that you would do only what you can do. God, I pray that you would meet every need. Speak to us in a personal way. Lord, I need you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated this morning. Thank you, worship team. Our children's pastor, Pastor Carl, loves to take, the advantage, uh, take advantage of when my wallet is out sitting on a lunch table or in my office. And uh, he doesn't take anything out of my wallet. He likes to put things in my wallet. And that sounds great until you realize that the money that he actually put in my wallet is not real money. You think it's m- real money until you take it out and it's got his face on it. <laughs> it's got his face smiling, it's him. It's a counterfeit, it's a fake. 
And although I would love real money to be put in there, there are different ways for us to see in our lives. Sometimes what's very interesting is that there are dollar bills, $100 bills, $20 bills that look real, that smell real, and they feel real, but yet they are counterfeit. They are not real. It's not real money. In, in presentation, it presents itself as real, but it has no value. People are trying to deliver something that is not of value, that cannot purchase anything. And now they even have a little pen or machines that they put the dollar bills into to, to figure out if it's real or not. Have you ever, have you ever uh, seen those? They, they, they got the pen, they have the, that pen where, where you can write, where you can write what's going on. And, and quite honestly, it's very interesting when you see that and, uh, and they, they do that, they mark it to see if it's real or not. And, and if it's a counterfeit or if it's a, it's a real thing in, in our lives, can I tell you that the very thing that God has given us to see if something is real or fake is his presence. The advantage that we have in our lives is that he gives us the ability for discernment. The, the Holy Spirit has given us ability for discernment. And in this circulatory letter, John wrote to, the apostle John wrote to the believers as this letter was passed around there. We know that there's an antichrist, but now there's many antichrists, meaning that he makes it clear that there isn't just a deceiver. There are, there are many deceivers. There are counterfeits everywhere and they're all over the place. In our world today, there are many counterfeits. Anyone who denies God or pushes or points people away from God or to anything other than God is a counterfeit. There are a lot of counterfeits in our world, aren't there? Yes. Here's the problem. They present themselves as real, but they have no value. A lot of people have placed, them, placed their lives, their hopes in, in something other than Jesus and it's, lead, it's left them with counterfeits. He makes it clear that there isn't just a deceiver, there are antichrists, counterfeits everywhere. And, and, there are, and, and in our world, there are counterfeits and God, we, we, we see this all the time that people present something as truth, but yet it's not, pointing people to Jesus. And much of their time is not trying to get people to worship a false God as much as it is to put their trust in valueless things. The apostle John is writing and saying that I, I want you to understand there are people that are trying to deceive you. And here's what I believe that the apostle John were here today. He would say this, that you are anointed for discernment. You are anointed for discernment to know whether something is truth or a lie. To know, that, to know that what is being said is real or fake. The anointing, the, what, what is the anointing? What is the anointing? In, in the Old Testament, the, the practice of anointing is when they would pour oil on somebody's head for the sake of a, a God-given specific assignment. We see the anointing of, uh, of Aaron and his sons when they were anointed priests in Exodus chapter 28, verse 41. And in 1 Samuel chapter 16, Samuel was sent out to anoint the shepherd boy David to be the next king. In 1 Kings chapter 19, God called Elijah, Elijah to to anoint Elisha as the next prophet. And I believe in that kind of anointing. I believe that God has called us and placed us in specific places and assignments with extra favor and grace and blessing from God Almighty in heaven. And I believe when we think about our God-given assignments, we think about, even, even in my own life, I think about my assignment here at High Point, that God has given us a favor, a grace and understanding for our own lives. And, and without that favor, that blessing on my life, I cannot do this. This is way beyond my personal ability, but yet it's God's favor. It's God's anointing for the, me to be able to do what I'm doing. It's God's favor on your life that to, for you to be able to do what you're doing. It's an anointing from God for an assignment, but a, God's anointing for, for our lives goes beyond an assignment. It goes, it goes beyond what for, for the here and now. It's, it's not just on us, it's also in us. Here's what I want you to write down this morning, that the anointing that we have isn't just on you, it's in you. The anointing that we have just isn't on you, it's in you. Here's what the apostle John says. He says, but you have been anointed by the Holy One and you all have knowledge. It's not just on you, it's in you, you have knowledge. When you dig into the Greek, you find that the Holy One is the Holy Spirit that you've been anointed by the Holy Spirit. And that is our advantage. Verse 27 in, in this passage says, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in what? Would you say it out loud? In you. It abides in you and have no need that anyone should teach you. 
1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? The anointing is not just on you, it's in you. And you, you have that. And we get a lot of times we think, man, how can I get that? When you accept Jesus into your life, you have all of him. You have all of his presence. You have complete wholeness in your life. It is the very presence of God on the inside of you. And you've got it. I... I uh, a couple months ago, I was out shopping with one of my friends, Pastor Peter, uh, who is our teaching pastor here at the church. And he, we were heading to an event and he said, man, I, I, need a, I need a shirt to wear for this event. I need a fresh shirt because I want to feel good at this event. And you know, like Coach Prime says, if you feel good, you play good. Anybody? Come on, y'all. Y'all got to loosen up a little bit. You know, you know what I'm talking about. So he's like, I got to, man, I, I, I brought a shirt to this event, but I don't like the shirt that I'm going to wear to the event. So I got to go get a new shirt. Everybody, you ever been there before? You're like, I'm just not sure about this outfit. You were there this morning. That's why you're here at the 1030. You know what I mean? Like, it's planning on that. Hey, but hey. So we go to the store. He, he goes into the store, finds a shirt that he likes and uh, tries it on, purchases it. And he, and he FaceTimes his wife. Uh, to confess that he just bought some new clothes. And no, he just told his wife, hey, look, I got a new shirt. And she pauses on the phone. And she looks at him intently. And she says, uh, hey, Peter, you already had that shirt. He said, no, I don't, no, I don't. She said, yeah, you bought it four weeks ago. He already had it. He already had it, it was already there. He forgot, he forgot. I don't know what that's like, but he forgot. <laughs> he forgot the very thing that he already possessed because he was busy, because he was running around, because he was doing all this stuff. How often is that you and I? That we already, we forget what we already possess. We forget that God's already placed his spirit on the inside of us. A lot of times people are like, how do I get that? Listen, the very moment that you give your life to Jesus, you get the fullness of Jesus in your life, which is his presence on the inside of you. He abides in you and the fullness of the reality of salvation becomes, it's not, it's not just something that you might have or you have to go purchase. You have it within you. You already own it. You don't have to go looking for it. You don't have to cross it off a list and then in order to get it again, listen, it's a gift from God and the Holy Spirit doesn't come and go. It gives us the ability to discern. It is our advantage, our advantage to discern the apostle Paul, apostle John isn't just telling the church he was, the churches that he was writing to that that it didn't um, that teaching didn't matter. I think when we read this or when we read this, sometimes people are like we don't need anybody to teach us. Listen, if you really think about it, he was actually teaching them when he was writing to them. What he was saying is that you have the ability to discern these antichrists, these little peop these people who are trying to deceive you to pull you away from the further away from the truth rather than to the truth. There's a very string, strong reality in our world today that there are many people that have agendas and plans that present themselves as truth. A lot of people say, oh, it's my truth. It's my truth. No friends, there is only one truth. There is only one truth. And God has given us his word and his spirit so that you may be able to discern what is lie from truth. We have a whole generation of young people believing a lie because we, they don't know the truth. The scripture says that if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And when you grasp God's word, when you understand God's word, when you discern is this right or wrong? No, I wanna do what I think. No, you are not a good God. You are a person with a, with a moral construct that is flawed. Your, your truth is trash, I'm sorry. but you need the truth of God in your life to discern what is real and what is fake and what the apostle Paul is, or John, I'm sorry, is telling this church. He's saying that all these people are pursuing to deceive you and we must live our lives with open eyes in 2024 because there are many things that people call truth that are lies and call lies truth. Too real. 
But we must understand that God has given us the advantage of the Holy Spirit to be able to discern and is living on the inside of us. So today I wanna to encourage you. You're like, man, he's fired up. I was on vacation last week, that's why. <laughs> Three encouraging statements about the advantage of the anointing. Statement number one, the advantage of the anointing is that it shows us when to go, where to slow, and when to say no. The advantage of the anointing in our lives shows us when to go, when to slow, and when to say no. Can we say this together? The advantage of the anointing is that what shows us when to go, where to slow, and when to say no. That's not just a catchy preacher statement. I made it rhyme and so that you would remember this statement because I believe that there are a lot of people in our lives, even me, we all love green lights, but we hate red lights. I lived in the East Coast and in Boston. I don't know if this is true or not, but they used to say that all the roads were uh, made, they were once like deer trails. It felt like it. The roads were just all over the place. If you've ever been on the Northeast, there are some roads that were planned, but a lot of them just don't make any sense at all. You feel like I'm going West here. It's like very clear cut. Like I'm going West. The mountains are that way. And, and you know, the other, it's East, what North? No, it's like there you go to go East, you go Northwest. Makes no sense. These, these trails are just all over the place. Now they say that the, the deer trails ended up turning into horse trails and then carriage trails and then eventually roads. Now, I don't know if it's true or not, but it, it takes a lot longer to get anywhere. To, take, to get to the grocery store, it was just a, it was like a part-time job. You take an hour just to get there. I'm like, I don't like this. I'm a suburb guy. <laughs> like, I, I, don't, I don't like take, I don't like sitting in traffic. I don't wanna, I don't, that's not for me. I don't think that's God's plan for my life, right? So, so I just, so I'm like, that just takes forever. It takes so stinking long to get anywhere. And I did not like it. And, and I think a lot of times in our faith journey, sometimes we love hitting all green lights, thinking that the Holy Spirit wants to give us a green light to a destination. But God's greatest gift sometimes is a yellow light to slow down. God's greatest advantage sometimes is the ability to say the word no. A lot of times we want green lights, green lights, green lights, green lights, but God's greatest gift is for us to say no sometimes. Paul, the greatest missionary in church planning, went on three missionary journeys. You can read about them in the book of Acts. And in his second missionary journey, he had plans to go west. But in Acts chapter 16, it says that the spirit of Jesus would not allow him to go. I want you to understand something so clearly that Paul had the right desire to do the right thing. He was fully qualified to do the thing that he wanted to do. But yet at the same time, the Holy Spirit said, no. We don't know what that was. We don't know how we knew that, but something on the inside of him helped him understand that, man, I should not be going there. So he said, no. Can't do it. The spirit, it says the spirit blocked them. It was, not, it was not capable. Sometimes the Holy Spirit says yes, and we feel very confident and free to proceed and proceed with a business deal, proceed with a relationship, proceed with a big purchase. But you've got to understand that other times the Holy Spirit says, slow down. Slow down. Everybody say slow. Slow down. Yeah. Oh. It may not be wrong, but it may not be the right time. It may be in your future, but not right now. I learned a phrase growing up, my dad told me all the time, partially because I would say things and then think. I love that my dad still says that to me today. But <laughs> he would use this phrase often with me and he would say time and place. When I heard time and place, I heard rut row roach. I said the wrong thing at the wrong, I said the right thing at the wrong time. You ever heard that? Time and place. Sometimes God's greatest advantage through his Holy Spirit is saying time and place. How do we know whether we are supposed to go, whether we're supposed to slow down, or we're supposed to say no? How do we know in our lives what that looks like? How do, how do we know w w when we should? I think sometimes we, we've got to understand that when God says slow down, it's often that, that like little check in your, in your gut for me. 
It's that, oh, no, wait, hold on. Oh, it's not like this audible voice, just, oh, we want that, right? But a lot of times it's like that, oh, something in my, in the tuning fork of my spirit says, hold on, let's ask more questions. I'll tell you my greatest regrets in life when I have ignored those small little checks have been my greatest regrets. It's not even when it's, when it's like this hard no or this wrong thing. It's just like this right thing, but wrong time. My greatest re- regrets in life and leadership are when I ignored those small little checks. God's greatest gift to us sometimes is just the ability to say slow down. Other times the Holy Spirit says no. And although it might be the, the, a good idea, the right idea, and the right desire, for some reason, something unknown to us, God says no. Some of you need to understand your desire. We don't have a, a, an immense amount of single people in this area, but some of you, your desire to date, and God's saying no, and you keep saying yes. Listen to me. I'm telling you, don't ignore God's check in your spirit. Because who you marry is the greatest decision outside of following Jesus that will affect the rest of your life. It is so important that you are willing to find someone who desires the same things that God desires for your life. If you're pulling in opposite directions, you're only gonna, you're gonna create a tension and every step of distance in between is going to cause frustration in your spirit. And 10 years down the road, I can't tell you how many times we've sinned with people. I just, I hear people say, I had a check in my spirit and I, I thought I could change them. Listen, you're only gonna get more of what you see. <laughs> it's gonna multiply because you're just around them more. But you gotta listen to that. Some of you, a business deal, you're like, man, I, I just feel like this is what, I feel like I'm just nervous, but I know this is what I'm supposed to do. It's not just saying no. It's sometimes it's saying go, take the step, pursue the dream. Do the deal and watch God move on the other side. God's greatest gift sometimes is the gift of saying, go slow and sometimes even no. That anointing keeps us on track. It keeps us on track, big time. In fact, I remember, uh, anybody ever remember those little car train systems that, that you could control with your hand and the faster that you held down the little car, it just went faster. Does anybody remember it? Like the little cars. Like, and I would just hold those bad boys down as fast as they could possibly go. <laughs> Crash and burn. Why do we have so many crashes and burns in our world today? Because everyone wants a green light, won't, 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 pay, won't pay attention to the yellow lights. Sometimes it's time to whew, take the foot off the gas a little bit and allow the presence of God to protect you. I look back when I have obeyed and I have listened to God and I look back on situations and say, I know that God has protected me from that. The advantage of the Holy Spirit, the advantage of the anointing is God's protection. This, number two, the advantage of the anointing is that it's a channel for clarity on God's heart, shaping us to better reflect him. The advantage of the anointing is that it is a channel for clarity on God's heart, shaping us to better reflect him. As my boys get older, they love to do what dad does. Uh, they love to order what I order off the menu. It's increasing our bills exponentially. Y'all pray for your pastor. <laughs> These boys can eat. In fact, while we were gone, Micah decided that he was going to have two meals one night. We were on a cruise. So guess what? Go for it, son. Do what dad, I, can I just tell you though, he ate twice as much as I did that night. And then yes, we did pay the price. We were bad parents and let him do it. And then later he couldn't, he couldn't handle all that dad had. <laughs> he gets sick. Oh yeah, I know. He learned his lesson though. <laughs> he ain't gonna do that again. But they wanna do what dad does. They, they wanna do the activities. They wanna go outside. They wanna pull weeds. They wanna, they want, they wanna do all the things. And, and, and our goal in life as followers of Jesus should to become more like our father in heaven. Not just to be, a lot of people are searching for individualistic 
identity, but your greatest identity is not more of you, it's more of Christ in you. It's more Christ in your life, through your life, and to to be responsive to him everywhere we go, to show his grace, to show his kindness and his love. We are called Christians, little Christ. Do you live like it? Do you talk like it? Do you represent Christ everywhere that you go? He gives us full, how do, we, how do we live like little Christ? How do we live as Christians in our world? He gives us access to his, to his heart. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, it says, no one can know a, person, know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. Paul's essentially saying to the church in Corinth that no one cannot know the true composition of God, meaning the deep matters of his heart without coming to know a, the spirit of God. And by no, I mean having a greater understanding than a, than a conceptual understanding about God, not just a facade about God, knowing not, not just knowing about what God does, but to actually know his heart, to have a relationship with him in a greater way. I, I want you to grasp this today. I want you to think about, um, I want you to think about professional athletes, okay? And I, I want you to interact with me this morning. How many of you know the name LeBron James? Okay. Hold them up, hold them up, hold them up. Hold them up. Okay. This is the most interactive some of you have ever been in church. It's great. Okay, put them down. How, this is about 99 point something percent of people in this room, okay? A lot of people know Okay, how many of you would say that you know some of his accomplishments? Okay. Drop down. How many of you have his phone number? Come on, my man, let's go. <laughs> See if we get some tickets this week. I would say that's probably not even true. <laughs> it's okay. You're welcome here. Uh, it's all good. Here's the point. A lot of people know about him, but don't know his deepest desires. They don't know his character. They don't know his composition, his makeup of who he is. We, we in our culture today have a lot of Christians that know about the Holy Spirit on a surface level, but don't know the Holy Spirit in deep desires. We have a lot of people who know about God and what he does because they come to church on a Sunday, but can I tell you, your salvation is secure when you follow Jesus. But the other thing that you got to understand is that you can know Jesus Monday through Saturday and know his heart. You can know his heart because you have the Holy Spirit. Paul goes on to say this, that like, we will never possess more than anything more than common knowledge about God without discovering and engaging with his spirit. Paul goes on to say this, that we have not received a spirit of the world, but the spirit, of, the spirit who is from God so that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. What an amazing statement. I want you to understand that no one knows the thoughts of God except for his Holy Spirit, but he has given his Holy Spirit to us, which gives us insight and understanding so that we can live more like him. We should strive to live more like Jesus and how we conduct ourselves. Otherwise, 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 we become like one of the antichrists. I'm not saying you're the deceiver. Please hear me. I'm not saying that you're the antichrist. The, 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 and that. No, but what I'm saying is that if you point people to anything other than Jesus, you're joining the crowd rather than following Jesus. And you're pointing people the wrong way. So we must be clear and understand and know what God desires. Know his heart. Number three, the advantage of the anointing is that it gives us supernatural understanding. The advantage of the anointing is that it gives us supernatural understanding. Verse 27 says, but as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it is taught to you, abide in him. Abide in him. It gives us supernatural understanding. Understanding of what? What God desires. See, most of the time we, 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 we are struggling with the Holy Spirit, the advantage, because we like to function out of our five senses we, 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 want, we want to be able to see it. We want to be able to feel it. We want to be able to taste it. We want to be able to hear. We want to know all these things. But can, dare I say that the Holy Spirit is a sixth sense and not like a creepy kind of movie kind of way, but, a, but an understanding that is beyond our senses. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And in verse 10, Paul goes on to say this, But it was 
to us that God revealed these things by his spirit for his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. What am I saying is that God wants to take you from understanding from a distance and seeing what he's doing to give you his heart and his understanding. And it's more than just what you see with your eyes. It's more than what you can pick up on your own. It's more than what you can hear with your ears. It lets you perceive what you would normally not think on your own. It pulls you out of a physical realm into a spiritual realm so that you can perceive and experience and sense what is from God and what is not from God. And that's what the Holy Spirit does on the inside of you. What an advantage that you and I have in the Holy Spirit, that it helps us, strengthens us. As the band is coming, I, I, I know that there are so many counterfeit issues in our world, people presenting things and, and, and pushing things that are seen to be truth but have no value, are not truth, are lies. So how do we know and how do we activate the advantage. Here's what I want you to grasp today, that abiding in God is the current that keeps the anointing flowing. If you disconnect, it fades away. Abiding in God is the current that keeps the anointing flowing. If you disconnect, it fades away. What am I saying? Is that you gotta, when you stop staying with God, the, the anointing stops. When you stop abiding in God, the anointing stops flowing. When you stop abiding, the anointing dries up. You've got to find the place where there is power. Several years ago, Morgan and I were living on the East Coast. We had a massive storm come through and we lost power and it was freezing cold in our house. And, uh, and quite honestly, uh, we, it was too cold to stay in the house with no, no electricity or connectivity to, to any power with our little guy. We loaded up, found the nearest place. We found the nearest place that we could and uh, the nearest hotel down, I think it was an hour plus away. And we drove there and loaded up for the night and stayed there until our power was restored. And, 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 and what's the point? The point is this, is that sometimes if you're in a dry, weary place, you have to grasp and understand that you need to change your location and get yourself into a place of power in order till your life restores its power. You, you got to... You, you got to restore the power. How do we got to take time to do that? That's why, that's why I'm so excited about family camp this summer. That's why if I weren't the pastor, I'd still be going to family camp this summer with my boys, because I know that my greatest encounters with God, my most encouraging moments with God were at an altar at camp that changed the trajectory of my life. And I want that for my boys. And I want that for you. Not just as an, I don't want that just for my boys. I want that for myself once again, because we go through seasons where we don't feel like we have the anointing, where we don't feel uh, what, what, I, what, what it feels like. Sometimes people say like, why, why can't I feel God? Why, how come I can't feel God? Well, I want to encourage you. There are seasons where I don't feel God too. You're like, well, you should, you're a pastor. No, I am a Christian that follows Jesus. My assignment is just different. So what do I do? when I don't feel God, I keep doing what I know is right. Because my faith in Jesus is not a feeling, it's a decision. So I decide to follow Jesus despite a feeling. How do I, how do I hear God's voice more? How do I, how come I can't hear him as clearly as I want? I think sometimes you've got to turn the volume down on the other voices that are speaking loudly. Some of you need to turn the voice of Google down in your life a little bit and allow the voice of the Holy Spirit to speak to you too. Some of, some of you need to turn down the voice of an endless news cycle and give the space of the Holy Spirit moving, time to move in your life, to abide in. What if for the next 20, 30 days, you maybe even fasted lunch? What does that mean? That you don't eat lunch? You're gonna survive, I promise. Some of you are like, I do that anyways. But what if you took that time instead of just pounding through lunch and working through lunch, what if you took 20 or 30 minutes a day and actually spent time with God during that time to abide in him? Maybe some of you taking 10, 20 minutes in the morning to get up, God forbid, earlier than you normally do. So you're not rushing out the door. Some of you, you're at the 1030 service because you were trying to figure out what to do and you're late. Oh no, right? So what do I do? It's take 10, 20 minutes a day to spend time with him, to abide in him. Because life is not just about feeling God or being like, oh, I'm just convinced. Listen, you've got to listen, abide, sit in and wait for 
God to speak. It takes time abiding in his presence. Abiding in his presence, spending time with God, staying with God, being intentional with your time with God, making him a priority in your everyday life. Because that's where God changes our lives. Would you stand to your feet this morning? I just want us to practice this this morning. Before we go, would you just lift your hands as a sign of surrender to to the Lord and just close your eyes. Nobody's going to do anything weird. I just want you to focus and don't be distracted by anything else going on. And I just want you to ask out loud that the Holy Spirit would fill you and strengthen you. That the Holy Spirit would shape you and mold you that he would give you understanding and strength, that he would show you where to go, when to slow, and when to say no. Can we pray that prayer out loud? God, speak to me. Right now, I wait for you so that I can hear your voice in a greater way. Lord, I want to honor you in everything that I am and everything that I do. Give me understanding so that I honor you with my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes I think that if we don't feel God, we think that God has forgotten us. Sometimes I think that when we're processing difficult situations, we ask God, why me? What's going on? Like, how, where are you in all of this? But yet God's presence on the inside of you is there available to you right now. If you follow Jesus, if you don't, you can just simply say, God, I need you in my life right now. You don't need a special moment. You just say, God, I need you. I, I confess my need for you in my life. And I'm sorry for the mistakes that I've made, but if you're here today and you feel like, man, I, man, I don't really know. I, I, I think that God's forgotten me. Know that God has never forgotten him. God is in pursuit of you today and he wants to renew you and he wants to strengthen you and he wants to guide you and he wants to give you understanding and he wants you to be able to discern and know everything that he desires. And there, was a ne- there is never a moment in your life, never a moment in your life where God has overlooked you or forgotten you. He's not forsaken you. In fact, God's presence is pursuing you today. And this is my prayer as we sing this song this morning before we go, is that you would understand that there was never a moment in your life where God has forsaken you or forgotten you today. I want this to be the prayer. Would you receive this? And like God speaking it over you, that there was never a moment, never a moment in your life Were you forsaken? Come on, he's here. He's here. Let us sing this. He's here. He's here.
God, we thank you for your presence in this place. God, we thank you for the encouragement of your spirit. God, we thank you for lifting weary heads. God, we thank you for the power that you give us, the discernment, the understanding. Lord, we give you all the praise and all the honor in the matchless name of Jesus. Everybody who believes that, say amen. Amen. Church family, I'm so thankful for you. I pray that you have a great week, and I can't wait to see you next Sunday. The best is yet to come. We'll see you then. God bless.